We're studying, you remember, chapter 19 of the Westminster Confession of Faith of the Law of God. And we concluded last time, so as to get the matter before you, with reading section 6, which is so full that I really can't take time to read it again. It's a, a long paragraph, and you will remember from having listened to it, it shows all the valuable uses of the moral law for the world in general, for the Christian life, and so on. And then it concludes with this very important statement to which I must call your attention before we go on to the final section. And that is that it is no evidence, that is, the knowing and doing of this moral law of so many uses and so on, is no evidence of his, the Christians, being under the law and not under grace. And I think I mentioned to you in an earlier lecture, there are some people who simply cannot get the difference between necessary law-keeping or morality and meritorious law-keeping or morality. The reason for the antinomianism being taught by many, I suspect, well-meaning Christian teachers is that whenever they hear the word law, and especially the necessity of keeping the law, they hear meritorious law-keeping and suppose it's another gospel and that somebody is teaching salvation by virtue of law-keeping on the merit of obedience. Now, Westminster is saying, no, 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 a thousand times no. There is no merit, even if we were perfect. We would still have been unprofitable servants. We would have only done what is our duty to do. There's no such thing as super arrogating, you remember, and so on. But if you're a Christian, keeping of the law of God, which has not been abolished, as has the ceremonial law, is absolutely obligatory. You cannot be on the way of salvation in defiance of the commandments of God. This is the will of God. And a Christian is a person who is determined to do the will of God. A person who couldn't care less about the will of God, by definition, is no Christian. These laws are, meritori are, are necessary and non-meritorious, and they have all the benefits which are mentioned, but at the same time, Westminster is reminding us in the spirit of the whole gospel, this is not putting you under the law in the sense of Romans 6, 14. We're not under the law, but under grace. The Jews were making that fatal error to which the Jew, converted Jew Paul was referring because they thought that they did gain favor with God by the keeping of the law. They were under the law. And Paul was virtually shouting at them because he loved his kinsmen after the flesh. He was willing to die for them if it would do them any good. Don't you realize, my friend, if you were going to be saved by the law, you couldn't make a, one single mistake. And here you're born a mistake. You're born in sin and so on, and you fail in everything. Don't you realize you'll never? They didn't realize it. They were rejected because, as Paul says in the 10th chapter of Romans, seeking to establish their own righteousness on the merit of keeping the law. They refused the righteousness of God, which was by grace alone. They wouldn't submit to that. No, thank you. That's an insult to me. I'll stand on the record. Thank you. I'll keep the law, and you as a good and honorable God will reward me accordingly, and so on. If he rewards you accordingly, says Paul, he's going to damn you forever because you sin in thought, word, and deed every moment of your life. The law requires absolutely perfect morality inwardly and outwardly every moment of your existence, and you don't give it for a single moment. So we are, we're going to be meticulously careful in the keeping of the law. And some people who are not very judicious and discerning and so on are going to jump to the wrong conclusion because that man wouldn't steal a penny from anybody, including Uncle Sam, because that person wouldn't shade the truth regardless of anybody's feeling, because that person would die rather than compromise principle. There are going to be the dummies along who are going to think that person supposes he's making his own way and saving himself by the keeping of the law. And we will say if they'll ever ask us, no, no, no. 
Nothing in my hands I bring. There's not one iota of merit in all of my law keeping. This is an evidence of my love for Christ. He says to me, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I say, Lord, I love you. And I, therefore, am going to the endeavor to keep every commandment you have ever given me perfectly, acknowledging all the way that I never have succeeded in keeping any one of them perfectly for one solitary moment, trusting on you and your salvation all the way. The way I put it sometimes when I'm commenting on our Lord's words there in Matthew 5, 20, unless your morality exceeds, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is that unless you Christians who are trusting in salvation by grace in this domain of necessary law keeping, righteousness of conduct, unless you keep the law more carefully than these people here who hope to save themselves by the keeping of the law, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. You get that, Christian friends? You get that? To be a true Christian, you have to be incomparably more moral in your conduct than people who think they're going to save themselves by their moral conduct and not yield for a moment to the temptation of supposing that there's some merit in your conduct and that you actually are saving yourself by what you're doing. Thus saith Westminster, more than Westminster and infinitely greater than Westminster, thus saith Jesus Christ, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees who are hoping to save themselves on the merit of their performance, you will never enter my kingdom. You are no Christians. I will have to say to you at the last judgment, even when you call upon me, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Now we come to a very important historical section, chapter 20, entitled, Of Christian Liberty and Liberty of Conscience. There are four heavy, important sections here. The first reads this way, the liberty which Christ has purchased for believers under the gospel consists in their freedom, a number of things, now listen to this, their freedom from the guilt of sin, what rejoicing, see, the condemning wrath of God, that's even more wonderful, the curse of the moral law, in their being delivered from this present evil world, that's good news, bondage to Satan, that's even better, and dominion of sin, from the evil of afflictions, notice, not from afflictions, but our liberty is deliverance from the evil of affliction. Boy, that's choice. That's semi-inspired. That's just about an infallible utterance. How can you, how can you possibly approve on that? Freedom not from affliction, but from the evil of affliction. The sting of death, not death, but the sting of death, which is sin, you see. The victory of the grave. The grave? No, but the victory of it. The grave is, a, is our transition to glory. It's our victory, not death's, not the sin's victory, you see. And most significant of all, liberty is freedom from everlasting damnation. As also in their free access to God, it's the positive things now, and their yielding obedience unto Him, not out of slavish fear, but a childlike love and a willing mind all which were common also to believers under the law. But under the New Testament, the liberty of Christians is further enlarged in their freedom from several things. Please notice, in their freedom from the yoke of the ceremonial law, boy, that was a burden to be free of, to which the Jewish church was subjected. Notice, Jewish church was subjected and in greater, we have greater boldness of access to the throne of grace. They had access to the throne of grace through this very elaborate ceremonial system and so on. We have greater, freer access to the throne of grace, but the same throne of grace, the same access, but a greater degree of it. And finally, in full communications of the free spirit of God that believers under the law did ordinarily partake of. See, that's what we have as benefits here. Now, when it says the believers under the law or the Mosaic dispensation did ordinarily partake of, 
I imagine what they were thinking of, I'd have to read the Mitchell's minutes here to find this out for sure, but imagine what they were thinking of was the fact that Moses communed with God face to face. That was uh, the only case we hear of in the Old Testament. But apart from Paul, you don't hear of a case of that in the New Testament, except insofar as they talk with God incarnate, who could say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. But uh, not very many Christians have that kind of privilege. But otherwise, our privileges quite transcend the others, but they differ in degree rather than in kind. Here's an interesting little detail that I don't normally take time for, but it's worth observing just as a reminder that there have been little, uh, relatively insignificant changes. I think I mentioned at the beginning of this series that I, I always think there are changes for the worse. I don't think there's really been any improvement except in phraseology and language. Some of these expressions are archaic, as you see, that type of language we no longer use, but everybody understands just the same. But uh, usually the changes are minor uh, be, uh, before 1958, and, but even then, usually they've been better not changed, I think. But now here's a, here's a very minor change, and yet I think Westminster was better originally. The third benefit, which is mentioned here, is in full communication to the spirit of free spirit of God. That's the way the uh, revision has it. The original statement was in full er communication to the free spirit of God. And for the life of me, I can't understand why we have changed that. It is, after all, a difference of degree. They didn't lack it, the communication of God, totally, and we don't possess it perfectly. They had it, we have it more. And the original divines in 1647 said, we have fuller communication. Why didn't they leave it that way? Why'd they have to change it to full? As if we had something we don't have, and by implication, they didn't have something they did have. But at any rate, it's a minor matter, and I'm sure they didn't mean to make a serious uh, change in it. And the main point we shouldn't lose, namely, that liberty for a Christian is the freedom from all these awful things, the curse of death, the damnation of hell, and such things as that, and the positive, freer access to God in Jesus Christ by His own Spirit. The second section of Christian liberty and liberty of conscience reads this way, God alone is Lord of the conscience. Before I go any further, I've got to pause at that point just to remind you that that is not only a majestic utterance, God alone is Lord of the, of the conscience, but it is probably the most oft-quoted statement in the entire Westminster Confession. The Shorter Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism's first question, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's probably the most quoted statement of all of the Westminster Standards. But this particular expression, it's a hallmark of ecclesiastical liberty and moral liberty, and is constantly quoted by all sorts of people in and out of the Reformed tradition, and so on. God alone is Lord of the conscience, and hath left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are in any way contrary to his word, that's obvious, but listen on, or beside it in matters of faith or worship, so that to believe such doctrines or to obey such commandments out of conscience, that is, the commandments or the doctrines of men that are against or beside the Word of God, it says, to believe such doctrines or obey such commandments out of conscience, that is, from conscience, doing it conscientiously, is to betray true liberty of conscience and the requiring of an implicit faith and an absolute and blind obedience is to destroy Christian, destroy liberty of conscience and reason also. I think you all get the point of that, don't you? Everybody knows enough about churches, especially Rome, they're the prime example of it, which says that what we teach, you must believe. As I mentioned in the last lecture, Savonarola was cut off from the church triumphant, uh, the church militant now, and the church triumphant in the world to come because he did not submit himself to the commandments of Rome. And Rome did in the 16th century, and Rome does in the 20th century, though she says it in a much muted voice. And if you don't listen carefully, you don't hear it. And if you believe all the propaganda, you think she had left it, and so on. But it is still there. We had a classic instance of it. We have it currently there. A nun whose name I can't remember, you know, is in a welfare department in Michigan. 
and she has been ordered by the authorities in Rome to resign that job because it involves her in aiding and abetting abortion. Now, I agree that she ought not to aid and abet abortion. I agree she ought not to hold a job in which she has anything to do in the way of promoting abortion, except in the absolutely necessary one where both mother and child would die if the child were not aborted. But any other case, I think it's a sin, just as Rome thinks it's a sin. I agree with them completely. And so would Westminster, I'm sure. But the difference here is this. Westminster would say, you should desist from that activity because of God's will. God alone is Lord of the conscience. And if Rome would simply say, we believe it's the will of God that you should have nothing to do with abortion, it is therefore the law of our church, and if you therefore, in our opinion, want to be in accord with the will of God and in membership in our church, you will have to desist from your job. Now, her order should have said that in the first place, but at any rate, whoever says it would be justified if they said it that way. They don't say it that way. Rome doesn't operate that way. The Pope is the vicar of Christ, and the Roman church is the arm of Christ, and when the Roman church speaks, especially in its pontiff, that is the word of God. You obey because the Pope said it, because the church said it. It may be, indeed, what God commands. You get my point? I'm using this illustration especially because at a point where we're so closely identified, we agree completely. I do, at any rate, that it is the will of God that that woman should have nothing to do with that practice. I agree with Rome completely, but at the same time, she is violating that woman's liberty. She's telling that woman her, I'd say the same thing to her. If she ever asked my opinion, I'd say, abortion's a sin and you believe it. And you are participating in something which you yourself consider a crime. It is morally impossible. I have no authority over you. I can't threaten you. You're not gonna come before the judgment seat of John Gerstner. But I say you'll be brought before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And if you would obey the commandments of the Word of God, you'll desist from that job. That's all I can say. That's all Pope John can say. That's all any human being has any right to say. The liberty which we have in Jesus Christ is to God who alone is the Lord of the conscience. But while we're on this particular point here, distinguishing the, between the commandments of men and the commandments of God which can alone bind our conscience, let me show that the Roman Catholics don't have a monopoly on this type of transgression. They do have a monopoly on it in this sense. They defend it as a principle. I know of no Protestant church which defends it as a principle. I'm going to give you an instance where my own church has violated it as a matter of practice, but never enunciated the principle. Before I give that illustration, however, let me uh, call your attention to this implicit faith. Now, that is specifically a Roman doctrine. That is, once you become a member of the Roman Catholic Church, you accept her as the church established by Jesus Christ and her supreme bishop in Rome, the Pope, as the infallible head and the vicar of Jesus Christ in faith. Consequently, you not only believe all dogma she has officially declared to this moment, you believe all dogma or practice which she ever in the future may impose upon you. See, that's what they mean by implicit as over against explicit faith. You, you affirm explicit faith when you become a member of the church and are baptized as an adult and so on. But you do more than that. Now, you see, the difference between that and Protestantism is that we affirm that the Bible is the Word of God and various doctrines are spelled out by our particular denominations and we affirm them as an agreement that they are the Word of God. And we have implicit faith in anything else that we discover from the Bible. If there's anything in the Bible that I didn't know at the present time, I say in advance, prove it to me and I'm bound by it because that's the Word of God, see? It's altogether proper. You don't know all there is in the Bible. More truth is going to break out in it. I'm an old man and I expect to see a great deal more about the Bible if the Lord spares me any length of time than I know at the present time. And anything I find out at any time, I will believe implicitly, without question, without argument, because it's the Word of God. That's my liberty of conscience to Him who alone but I will not be obedient to you. I'll not be obedient to my denomination. I'll not be obedient to my Caesar. I'll not be obedient to anybody but to God. And nobody has the right to impose upon me any more than I have a right to accept that imposition, implicit faith. But let me give you an illustration that I was mentioning a moment ago. At the Protestant church, even though it disavows this principle, just as Westminster does, 
of obedience to the commandments of men which are contrary to or beside the commandments of Holy Scripture, that we eschew the principle, we sometimes unfortunately practice it. In my own Presbyterian tradition, back in the 30s, we had a problem which showed us as a denomination in violation of this principle. Some people appeared in our denomination who were very dissatisfied with many of our various doctrinal stances and so on and were critical, but particularly the foreign field. It led to the formation of the Independent Board for Foreign Missions. J. Gresham Machen was ahead of it, Presbyterian at the time, trying to rectify what he felt was a bad situation by the formation of this board. Now, our church denomination was so distressed by that that they not only required Machen and his associates to dissociate themselves from the Independent Board for Foreign Missions, soliciting from the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, but they, in one of their assemblies, went so far as to say, it is as imperative, these are not exactly the, the words, I don't have them handy, but the mandate was clear enough. It is as imperative for you to obey the board's, offices, decisions of the Presbyterian General Assembly as to receive the Lord's Supper. No, no, no. Jesus Christ said, this do in remembrance of me. He is the Lord, and what he says, we do. And until he comes again, we will do this in remembrance of him. If I, or you, or a body of people, a Presbyterian church, the Episcopal church, the Baptist church, it doesn't make any difference what combine of men it may be, ever put our doctrines or practices on a level of authority with the Word of God and try to bind the consciences of men, we must refuse it. The decision of the Presbyterian church about the independent board may have been sound. That deliverance utterly unsound. There is no principle in which we glory more often, no quotation we cite more frequently, than God alone is the Lord of conscience, but we forgot it on that occasion. God forbid that we ever do it again. Rome is committed to it, is what our section here is uh, saying. Now, section number three, they who, upon pretense, now here's the opposite thing. The, uh, my personal teaching, uh, goes along this line. Anybody who knows John Gerstner know, uh, with any degree of familiarity knows if there's any metaphor I'm using more often than any, it's this idea of the straight and narrow path, deviations to left or right, studiously, on pain of eternal death, to be avoided. God's commandments alone must be obeyed. And there are dangers to the right as well as to the left. Liberalism is fatal, and so is antinomianism. This doctrine of Christian liberty is essential. We've already shown how Rome errs to the right, having the audacity to impose implicit faith on its constituents. Now, in this next section, we're going to warn about the error to the left. Listen to Westminster. They who upon pretense of Christian liberty, do practice any sin or cherish any lust, do thereby destroy the end of Christian liberty, which is that being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, we might serve the Lord without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Anybody who can say this ridiculous ditty or think it is indeed under pretense of Christian liberty destroying the gospel, free from the law. Oh, blessed condition, I can sin as I please and still have remission. Protestantism has never committed itself to that. Rome is committed to this, but many Protestants then and now 
are operating on this principle that under the rubric of Christian liberty, I can do pretty much what I please to do. I am, my friend, free of you. I cannot be bound by you. I may have a genuine concern for you, and I may deny myself rights I have because of you, but I dare not be bound by you, but I must be bound by God. And if in my freedom from you and your commandments, I take the opportunity to thumb my nose at heaven and God's commandments, then I am as truly on the way to ruin as if I take the turn in the opposite direction. This majestic section concludes with a long paragraph. I'll read, make a brief comment on as we wrap up this brief discussion. Because the powers which God hath ordained and the liberty which Christ hath purchased are not intended by God to destroy, but mutually to uphold and preserve one another, they who, under pretense of Christian liberty, shall oppose any lawful power or the lawful exercise of it whether it be civil or ecclesiastical, resist the ordinance of God. And for their publishing of such opinions or maintaining of such practices as are contrary to the light of nature or to the known, please note that in light of nature even, or to the known principles of Christianity, whether concerning faith, worship, or conversation, that's lifestyle, or to the power of godliness, or such erroneous opinions or practices as, either in their own nature or in the manner of publishing or maintaining them, are destructive to the external peace and order which Christ has established in the church, they may lawfully be called to account and proceeded against by the censures of the church. You don't have implicit faith, you don't render obedience to men as you render them only to God, but where man is a duly constituted authority either in the church or the state, no one has a right to use Christian liberty as an excuse for defying the lawful mandates of men. He is to obey them because these established authorities are the conveyors of the authority of God. They in themselves not to be obeyed, but insofar as they carry out the law of God either as naturally revealed or as supernaturally revealed in Scripture, they are to be obeyed, and we know the Scripture says, as unto the Lord. That is, because of the Lord. And in serving them, we are not terminating on them, we are going beyond them to the God who appointed them. There's a I think I'll disp uh, dispense with any further discussion about the power of the civil magistrate, which is deleted here for obvious reasons when in America we have separation of church and state as they did not have in England when this was uh, formulated. It became inappropriate, and I don't have time here to discuss whether it was right or wrong to have an established state or not, but we just observe here that uh, there are legitimate authorities of men that have to be respected as unto the Lord. But a fuller discussion will come uh, under the section on the civil uh, magistrate. But we turn in our next chapter when we resume next time to chapter 21 of religious worship and the Sabbath day. Let me just say this one thing about that. I won't read anything. The Sabbath day was another clear, special, distinguishing feature of the Westminster Confession of Faith, just as the covenant doctrine that I mentioned before. And here again, they are deviating from the Westminster Confession, which, I mean, from the Reformation, which took what we call a loose or continental Sabbath in favor of very strict construction. And we'll notice that in particular when we return again.